Ahead on Newswatch, it is primary day in the Hoosier state and the results could mean the end of the road for GOP candidate Ted Cruz. See why. Plus, revival in West Virginia will show you how God is moving in the southern part of the state and the way we handle our money is changing. Hear why some say finance is having an uber moment. Thank you so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. It is primary day in Indiana and the stakes are high. A loss here could be devastating to the Cruz campaign and secure the Republican nomination for Donald Trump. Caitlin Burke has the story. Right. Conflict on the campaign trail is as intense as ever. Each candidate ending their campaign in Indiana with attacks against the other. A Donald Trump supporter even facing off with Ted Cruz, demanding he bow out. Do the math. I will protect you ask your cases right. to drop out, it's your turn. Well, take okay. your own word. Now I'm curious, sir. Time to drop out. Political analysts say this could essentially be the end of the GOP primary season. If Trump wins big in Indiana, he'll need just 40% of the remaining delegates to lock in the Republican nomination. And there's no way Cruz can win without a contested convention. According to Real Clear Politics, an average of different polls shows Trump up by nine points, by a margin of 42 to 33 percent. But Cruz says he isn't giving up, the Texas senator vowing to compete until the end against Donald Trump. There is a choice, a basic choice that Indiana has and the whole country has. Do we support a campaign that is based on yelling and screaming and cursing and insults? That is based on dividing Americans? Or do we support a campaign that is a positive, optimistic, forward-looking, conservative campaign? On the Democratic side, Bernie Sanders is in a close race with Hillary Clinton in Indiana. Let us see Indiana help lead this country into the political revolution. A victory for Sanders in Indiana would be an embarrassment for Clinton, but would do little to make much of a dent in her delegate lead. She's currently only about 200 delegates short of clinching the nomination. Clinton's campaign is already looking ahead on the next primary in West Virginia. For all the other political players, all eyes are on Indiana, the Republican primary specifically. A Trump win today potentially shifting the focus from primary season to the November general election. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom says religious persecution has gotten worse around the world. Its annual report released Monday says severe violations have been taking place in Egypt, Iraq, Nigeria, Pakistan, Syria, Vietnam, and the Central African Republic. The agency also lists China, Iran, North Korea, Saudi Arabia, and other nations as countries of particular concern. These countries may soon be subject to U.S. sanctions. The FBI has thwarted a terrorist plot to bomb a Jewish center in Miami. Police have charged 40-year-old James Medina with attempting to use a weapon of mass destruction. Authorities say he converted to Islam about four years ago. And in court Monday, he told the judge his name is now James Muhammad. He reportedly planned an attack at a synagogue on a Jewish holiday by shooting attendees with an AK-47. But he later switched to the idea of a bomb. He tried to pick up that bomb from an FBI informant on Friday. This guy uh, come and won't kill people and children in the synagogue. Kind of not surprised about it because um, he's threatened to um, shoot up a church before. The would-be terrorist said he wanted to attack because, quote, I have a lot of love for Allah. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has once again crossed President Obama's chemical weapons line, red line. The Israeli paper Haaretz reports Assad used the deadly sarin nerve gas against ISIS despite his agreement in 2013 to dismantle his chemical weapons arsenal. Meanwhile, with the war raging in Syria, Iran gaining power and Hezbollah building up its deadly missile forces, Israeli leaders are growing increasingly concerned. Chris Mitchell brings us that story now from Jerusalem. With all the threats on Israel's borders, its number one threat is about a thousand miles away, Iran. I would like to emphasize the fact that Iran is a different foe comparing to anything we experienced before in our 68 years of independence. General Golan says that Iran sees itself as an empire and is reaching into nearly every area of the Middle East to become the dominant power in the region. 
from Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and beyond. Just unbelievable. You can find Iran today everywhere. He said Israel takes Iran very seriously. When I hear Khamenei and every other prominent Iranian person talking about the inspiration of Iran, about the urgent need to eliminate Israel, I take it very, very seriously. They are not joking. Golan also pointed a finger at Hezbollah, Iran's terrorist arms spread throughout Lebanon. They have more than 100,000 missiles aimed at Israel. This is unprecedented threat to the Israeli civilians. He described what Israel's next war inside Lebanon would look like. We are not going to see small war in Lebanon. It's going to be decisive. It's going to be full-scale war. It's going to be with all the capabilities of the IDF. And I'm sorry to say that. I have no, no, I don't feel any sense of happiness when describing that. That could create devastating damage to Lebanon. In addition to trouble all around, Israel must fight cyber attacks and terrorism within its borders. For all these challenges, Golan says, the IDF needs to be prepared for the unexpected. Because changes in the region are so frequent. So we have to monitor the situation all the time and we have to be prepared to all kind of developments. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. The U.S. Education Secretary wants to overturn the gender bathroom laws in North Carolina and Mississippi. John B. King told the Education Writers Association Monday the laws are hateful and should be repealed. Meanwhile, LGBT activists are outing Christian schools over the Title IX exemption. The exemption prohibits school discrimination on the basis of gender. The Obama administration interprets that to also mean transgenders. Last week, the Department of Education, pressured by LGBT activists, listed more than 70 schools receiving a religious exemption. You can learn more by visiting our website. That is CBNNews.com. And some good news to tell you about today. Revival has broken out in southern West Virginia. Reports are pouring in of a spiritual awakening that started in a local church and is now touching the entire region. Wendy Griffith traveled back to her hometown of Williamson, West Virginia, to bring us the story of this remarkable revival. There's a new sound coming forth from the hills of southern West Virginia, a sound many prophets have foretold but haven't heard until now. For the past three weeks, the large sports complex in the small coal mining town of Williamson, West Virginia, has been filled to the rafters with people crying out for God. It all started when Tennessee evangelist Matt Hartley visited a local church for what was supposed to be a three-day revival service, but it just kept going. This is not man-made, charismatic, hyper-spiritual. This is the presence of God that is overwhelming us, that is being released upon hungry people that are tired of just stagnant Christianity and safe church. They want Jesus more than anything else, and that's why they're here. Hartley also spoke at the local high school, where revival seemed to break out among the students. 400 to 450 students got saved at Mingo Central through uh, Matt Hartley coming in and speaking at a voluntary prayer club meeting. It has just went from school to school, uh, from youth group to youth group. Denominational barriers have just been cast down, and we've just had a great spirit of unity. In the 1980s, this field house is where I helped cheer on the Williamson Wolfpack basketball team to victory. Great memories. But today, it's the only place big enough to hold what many say is the greatest spiritual awakening in Southern West Virginia history. We could not have done any of this if we wanted to. We've had so many different revival services, so many, you know, special services, and nothing like this. This is true awakening. Endicott says prayer plus desperation has paved the way for this spiritual breakthrough, especially among the young people. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Uh, I've never seen something like this happen where just the young people get on fire and it's really cool to come to church and it's really cool to worship God and nobody's judging you or saying anything about it uh, because they're all with you. We're, we're starting to have prayer circles at school before, before school and you know we're reading and having Bible studies at school. Others like Erica Priest of Lenore are seeing God answer very specific prayers. 
My husband just got saved this morning. I've been praying for him for months, and he'll be baptized this Sunday. He got saved this morning on a Monday morning? It's on a Monday morning at work with other men that are Christians that he works with. Hartley believes the sound of revival now being heard in these West Virginia mountains has the potential to spread around the world. I believe God has preserved this state for the end time awakening that's coming to America. I believe that this is the beginning of where it happens and it's gonna spread as a wildfire throughout the nations of this world, that Jesus is gonna be exalted and the more Jesus is exalted, the more the river of God is going to flow and we have not seen anything yet to what God is releasing. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Mingo County, West Virginia. U.S. missionary Kenneth Bay is speaking out about what it was like to be imprisoned in North Korea for two years. Bay was sentenced to 15 years of hard labor for trying to spread the gospel in North Korea. Although he suffered from isolation and illness during his captivity, Bay says he developed an even greater heart for the North Korean people. Since being released in 2014, Bay has written a book called Not Forgotten. He says he wants to raise a voice for the Americans still imprisoned in North Korea. CBN News will interview Kenneth Bay live on the 700 Club Wednesday, and you won't want to miss it. Coming up, it is the new trend in banking, and millennials are all over it. But digital banking is not just for young people. See how it can benefit older adults as well. Even more. If you want to see the future of banking and your money, it is at your fingertips on your cell phone. The idea is to make it easy for you to deal with your finances from anywhere, at any time. Caitlin Burke brings us a story. The banking industry is bracing for change thanks to the all-powerful digital revolution. The financial technology or fintech is really changing the way fundamentally that customers interact with their bank. Banking expert Rob Morgan says customers expect the same type of digital access to banking as they get with other important services. Take a second to think about it. I can get my mail on here, order dinner, even hail a cab. And now, thanks to financial technology, I can also access my money. In terms of banks and non-banks in the space, there are a number of players. And really, banks are looking pretty actively to partner in the space. So, Banks are looking, and as are these new companies, to work together to deliver the customer the best experience. Apple, Google, Amazon, the tech giants are all on board. Most are starting off with digital payment apps. They believe that um, this modernization of the banking sector is going to make uh, financial services more accessible, more affordable, and ultimately more secure. Brian Peters is with Financial Innovation Now, an organization that represents Apple, Amazon, Google, Intuit, and PayPal. I think whenever you have a little bit of competition and a little bit of change, it's tough. People uh, need a little bit of time to accommodate. But uh, this change is coming. It's coming quickly. Uh, it's here now. Uh, and uh, we're here to help policymakers understand uh, why this is good, good for consumers. While they may be a little late to the party, major banks have entered this new reality. You see banks all across the spectrum investing in things like innovation labs, where they're delivering these new products directly to customers. While banks are competing in this space, they face an uphill battle. According to the Harris Research Firm, 77% of consumers have a positive impression of the tech industry, compared to 35% who feel good about the financial industry. We see a lot of partnerships. So uh, it, it could be characterized as a big battle between Wall Street and Silicon Valley. But at the end of the day, we actually see a lot more nuance. Uh, there will be some skirmishes, and we're going to have a great, robust discussion about how to enable this technological future. Uh, but, but we're excited about it. Those skirmishes seem to be taking the shape of regulations. The tech industry wants breathing room for young startups, while the banking industry believes its new competitors should follow the same rules that it does. Today, there are a lot of rules and regulations in place that provide protections for consumers. And you need to make sure that those protections are being applied equally across the board. We're hopeful that policymakers can uh, find ways to uh, uh, minimize some of the early regulatory impact uh, that they may face uh, so that they can at least get off the ground, uh, prove their business model, 
and, and actually bring something to market. Security is a major concern of consumers when it comes to these new digital financial services. But Peter says your cell phone will eventually provide better protection of your information than a debit or credit card. When you think about making a payment or storing financial information on your smartphone, that smartphone is encrypted in a variety of ways uh, to gain access to it. On the later models now, you have to use uh, biometric fingerprint authentication. Because of all that additional security, uh, you have now both greater convenience and greater security. That didn't exist before. Some of the most popular news services include Venmo, Google Wallet, and Apple Pay. They allow you to transfer money and buy products without ever stepping into a bank or pulling out your credit card. This especially appeals to the millennial generation. According to Viacom Media, 73% of millennials prefer using digital services than going to a bank. I think you can use your smartphone for everything. I use my Venmo app, I use my Bank of America app, just everything can be done on my phone, which is great. My bank doesn't have any physical locations. I really do all of mine on my phone. But it's not millennials who stand to gain the most from this technology. Uh, there is a proportionally bigger opportunity to help older generations. Because if you uh, can't get around very easily, um, if you're in a small town where the bank branch is far away, uh, managing your finances can be tough. I recently got my grandfather hooked on taking care of some of his finances digitally. Hi, Poppy. Hey, babe. A few visits ago, I set you up with some um, new ways to do your banking. Why were you interested in doing your banking digitally? Well, it seemed to be uh, convenient and fast. Uh, also, it seemed to be cheap. No stamps, no envelopes. And the security was good because uh, it has had two passwords, one to get into the smartphone and one to get in the account. So all of those reasons, uh, and they all proved out, too. I, I find out all the time that there's new things that I can uh, apply and play with, and it's, uh, it's uh, fun and it's also interesting. Despite battles on Capitol Hill, both the banks and tech industry agree that ultimately the consumer will be the winner. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Up next, ministering to the elderly, how churches are meeting a critical need for China's aging population. China is one of the fastest developing countries in the world, and it is facing many new challenges, including lonely seniors. Now they're finding help from a surprising source, Chinese churches. Meng Fai Li has the story. It is estimated there will be 400 million people over the age of 60 and more than 94 million over the age of 80 by the year 2021. This growing population presents a burden on society, especially for the children, but an unlikely solution is presenting itself as many more older Chinese people are joining churches. For some Chinese seniors, Coming to church is a new experience, but they enjoy being with others and are open to hearing about Jesus. Before coming to church, I was alone while my children were away. I was so afraid of the loneliness. Today, I'm surrounded with church elders. I'm having fun in church and getting to know God. Working age children are moving to the cities for work and they bring their parents with them. Now, churches in large cities in China are recognizing this mission field and reaching out to the seniors through daytime activities. I am very pleased to start this ministry. It gives the church greater opportunities to know the local community members. Not everyone believes in Jesus, but we try to emphasize that we care about them and they are not alone. Jesus is always with them. Recently, Church leaders start to notice more and more younger Chinese people start to join the worship services. Mainly, they are invited by their elderly parents to join the Chinese Christian community. Older Chinese are slow to embrace Christianity, royal to the old ways. But local churches are working hard to get them involved in church activities through ministry and worship events. In this way, the Chinese Christian community is hoping to reach this important part of the Chinese society. Meng Fei Li for CBN News. 
CBN India's new webcast is making waves among its younger social media savvy audience. The new webcast is called CrossFit. It features short English videos aimed at 18 to 34 year olds. The training and encouraging videos tackle issues like identity, addiction, and so much more. A recent video for Women's Day featured a young girl's quest for love and acceptance and has seen some 260,000 viewers. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. Well, right now it is time for your Tuesday Tweetable, and this is a message I hope will inspire you, and you will in turn post, tag, tweet, and share it with others. If you're looking to be set free or delivered from something, remember this, deliverance is a walk of faith. The more you walk in faith, the more the shackles fall off. So keep walking in faith no matter what the circumstances may look or feel like. Let your faith rise above it. Scripture clearly says we walk by faith and not by sight. So put on those faith glasses and keep walking. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. We'd love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can always do it on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. Hope you join us again right here next time. Make this a terrific Tuesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow.